Hello, this is Dr. Ken with a lecture for the politics, or gender and politics rather, class on the subject of Roman masculinity. And I've, I've titled it Pater Patria, Father of the Fatherland, uh, which is going to be the sort of overarching theme of this lesson, uh, although we'll be talking about masculinity as well as femininity too. Now, um, carrying on from what we studied about the ancient Greeks last time, worth pointing out that in Rome, of course, much as in Greece, women can't vote. Um, they can't go to serve in public office or the military. But um, unlike in the Greek world, there is a, a somewhat increased level of equality between men and women amongst the Romans. And of course, it depends on which period we're talking about. I am speaking roughly from the period of the the Republic to the early Principate or the Imperial Regime. But, um, so for example, Roman women go to school, whereas Greek women, or at least Athenian women we know, didn't. Spartan women, you'll recall, did. Um, Roman women can own things in their own right. Citizen women can. Uh, they have somewhat more of a franchise than, th than their Athenian equivalents, but they're still, in many respects, second-class citizens. Um, and particularly amongst the elites of society, women are used as, as sort of political tools for marriage purposes. So arranged marriages are extremely common amongst the upper classes, um, often for some sort of political alignment or, or alliance or something along those lines. We'll be looking at one of those in a moment, and I'll mention another one too when we come to it. In terms of attitudes towards gender, masculinity is a really important virtue, as they see it. In fact, the word virtue um, in Latin, virtus, uh, has the root word in it, vir, which means man. So um, virtue itself as a concept, this positive state of, of, of moral being, uh, <clears throat> is, is, implies something like manliness. Um, it's similar to the, the ancient Greek, which I didn't mention last time, but the Greek word for courage or, and courageousness uh, is also the word that means manliness, Andreas. Um, so that it's, it's a very similar concept for the Greeks or the Romans. Manliness for the Romans is a positive attribute. How did they define it? Well, um, we'll be looking at some exemplars from sources that I've, I've put, primary sources that, that give you indications of how men ought to behave. I mean, part of it, much as with the Greeks, was through uh, mythical characters that they, they sought to emulate, like, like Hercules um, and others of the Greek tradition as well. But um, the, these roles seem to have been largely defined by society, too, at the level of family um, and in, in the wider society at, at the state level as well. So the title pater patriae means father of the fatherland and the romans referred to their country the, the, the word that translates to country um, is patria which means literally fatherland um, and father of the fatherland was an honorific title conferred upon certain individuals by the senate um, so who held this title well <clears throat> only a few people but well in, in the republican era a few people and then in the imperial period mainly just the emperors and not all of them. So one Marcus Furius Camillus, who was a dictator of Rome, they elected their dictators. They were chosen for a period of time to deal with crises. He dealt with an invasion by the Gauls and some other wars that took place in early Roman history. Um, he was afforded the title Father of the Fatherland. Cicero, um, who was an elected official in the Republic, he was a consul, which is the highest office in the state. Uh, he stopped a crisis that, that could have turned into a civil war called the Catalinian Conspiracy, um, and the Senate awarded him the title of Father of the Fatherland. Julius Caesar, right, after he defeats uh, Pompey Magnus in his civil war and gets himself declared dictator, having seized power with an army at his back, he also gets the, the title Father of the Fatherland. Um, and the last person in the Republic, I suppose, although his, his, his presence marks the transition to the imperial regime, Augustus Caesar, formerly known as Octavian, after he ends the civil war with Mark Antony and emerges as the first Roman emperor, although that, that's 
more complicated than you might think. He didn't. He didn't. He pretended not to be a monarch, but he was a monarch. He also gets the title Father of the Fatherland. Um, this is an honorific title, as I point out, and I put some in the notes about that. <clears throat> but it, it, it places the individual who has it in a position to the state, relative to the state, similar to that of what the Romans call the pater familias, the father of the family. Um, and what was that? Well, um, sometimes it's written as one word, sometimes two words, pater familias, father of the family. Uh, it could also be translated as owner of the family estate, a landholder, but a citizen male who is in charge of a household. But um, so it's the oldest living male in a household who could exercise autocratic authority over his extended family, and that's important. Um, the role of pater familias, father of the, of the family, this, 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 this applies to any household where there is a father. Uh, he was like an absolute monarch of his family. Um, he could, in theory, and we'll see some examples in this, of this from Livy, take the life of a child of his if he wanted, legally, and, and without any sort of recourse by anyone else to the court system or anything like that. It didn't happen very often, um, but it could happen. It, it was within his rights as pater familias to, to dispense, disperse with his children as he saw fit. So um, we get instances of sons who had risen to the highest offices in the land, having to be emancipated from their fathers. Otherwise, even as like a head of state, they would still be subject to the authority of their, their father. Um, and, and like I say, that the title <clears throat> pater, pater Patria, a father of the fatherland, puts the person who has it in a position vis-a-vis -vis in relation to, if you like, the, the country, like that of a father of a household. And like I say, that's an autocratic position. It's, it's, a, it's a position of supreme authority. So like I say, in the Republican era, when Rome was a republic, very few people actually got this title, and they were usually those who had saved the state from some extraordinary uh, crisis. When the emperors start getting it, and not all of them are, are awarded it, um, it, it just sort of reaffirms their position in the state. Um, as, as supreme, well, autocrat, even though, again, they, they, they avoided associations with monarchy well up until about the third century uh, because that monarchy was considered a bad thing. And we'll see why in a bit. We'll, we'll look at the story of when Rome threw out their kings in their early history. <clears throat> the kings were considered to be a bad thing for a very long time. So when Augustus emerges as the first Roman emperor, he has to disguise it. Um, with, with a number of, of titles and authorities and, and re, rejigging the government system to make it look traditional and yet be novel and, and under his control. But certainly his position in relation to the state was, was very much like that of the father of a household. And as I say, the Romans place a great deal of power and authority on the father. So this, this is an illustration of, of, of how manliness, how masculinity was was actualized. And this is, again, highly relevant to the study of politics because um, most, I think, political scientists agree that politics begins with the family uh, or, or began historically with the family unit. You've got someone who's in charge. It could be a father. It could be a mother. It could be both, usually one or the other. And you've got other extended members of the family who need to exert some sort of influence over that person to get them to do things for them or, or or to adjust their position within the hierarchy or something. So it's about, you know, politics is, 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 a, is about influence. It's about getting someone in power to do things for you or becoming that someone in power if you can. So these are, I think these, are, these things are highly relevant. Now I've given you some what I'm calling mytho-historical examples from the writer Livy which illustrate uh, both the familial roles of the, pot, the pater familias, but also gendered uh, sort of rules of behavior for men and women, or exemplars, let us call them, that men and women are meant to, to imitate. Pardon me, a few things, I wanna say a few things about Livy, just as a source, because you're gonna be reading him, hopefully, um, and you need to know a bit about, about him as a person. 
Um, he was uh, alive, <clears throat> his dates are, are 59 BC to AD 17. He lived through the Roman civil wars of Julius Caesar um, and um, as well as, the, as that of Octavian and Mark Antony. He was writing during the reign of Augustus. This is what Octavian, who, what Octavian becomes. He becomes Augustus Caesar. Um, and, and so his history is designed to be <clears throat> patriotic, <clears throat> pardon me, and to shore up some of the values of the regime, even if Livy didn't always agree with those. Um, I've put some further information about his writing. He wrote a history of Rome, <clears throat> pardon me, Trans the Latin title is Aberbe Condita, it translates to from the founding of the city. So he's written a history of Rome from the founding of the city, the mythical or mytho-historical founding of Rome. That took place in 753 BC, uh, up to his own time. And so a number of the stories that I've given you to look at from Livy come from early Roman history, and they, they may be based on real events. They, they're probably mythologized to a point but they all illustrate certain norms of masculine and feminine behavior and, again, crucially for you all, in a political context. Um, telling, in a way, guiding, giving people instructions on how they should behave um, in relation to society and the state. Livy was himself a Republican. Uh, his, his, his views are firmly, viewed in, uh, firmly rooted in Republican traditions. He expresses a fondness for Republican values. Rome has changed, though, in his lifetime from a republic to um, what I'm calling an imperial regime. Worth pointing out, Rome was an empire long before it had an emperor. Um, it, it became an empire, arguably, from, from the time that the, the city-state of Rome started conquering its neighbors in Italy. Certainly from the time of the Punic Wars, when it absorbs the Carthaginian Empire, including Spain, parts of Gaul and, and bits of North Africa. Um, it's certainly an empire state at that point, but it doesn't get a monarchical regime, an imperial regime, until the time of Augustus. And as I say, in the case of Augustus, he, um, up, he created a kind of sham whereby he, he restored the Republic. Um, it just so happened that, that he then held supreme power until his death. and and then passed that supreme power on to his heir, Tiberius, who did the same thing. Um, so it was a thinly disguised monarchy. He referred to it as the Principate, which means um, rule by, by the princeps, which translates to first citizen or first amongst equals. Um, but in reality, he was an emperor and, and the Roman government had, had changed regimes. So Livy, who is very much a Republican, is, is having to tread a thin line with his histories, which is his history is mostly of the Republic. Um, yet Augustus seems to have, have liked his, uh, have approved of his work. It got published. Most of it survives. Um, and, uh, and, and so we have these examples. Now the stories themselves, as I say, especially the early history of Rome, is um, it, it, partly fictionalized, mythologized. Some of it is based on real events. History, well, Livy is only as good an historian as his sources. Um, and his sources on early Rome are very scarce, and most of them are, as I say, stories passed down. But again, for our purposes, and, and for the purposes of, of his readership as well, you, you have to think they believe this stuff to be true. And even if they didn't believe it to be true, they were still, you know, being bombarded with a kind of uh, an image of, uh, or examples of how to behave if you're a man or a woman, reinforcing societal norms. So Augustus Caesar was, was really conservative in, in his moral outlook. Personally, he was quite different. He, he apparently flaunted most of the rules that, or flouted most of the rules that, that he, uh, he had imposed. Um, but, but publicly, he was extremely conservative. And Livy's history reinforced those conservative values, as well as patriotism and, and the dignitas, the dignity of Roman history, the gravitas, the weight, the significance of it as well. All that's in Livy. Um, but I wanted to give you that background on him before you start reading about him. And, and I've written, put some more in the notes for you to see. And as I say, his fictions serve to shape the ethos, the character, and to reinforce that character in the Rome of his era and in later eras. Let me give you some relevant terms to think about, too. Um, so, uh, and some other background. So, 
the Roman senators, right? Uh, the, the root word of that is synex, which means elderly. So the Senate is meant to be a, a group of older men. They were referred to as patres, fathers. Um, so that, that's another telling indication of, of, of the, the loaded term, or of a loaded term, if you like, um, c carrying masculine qualities. There were no mothers in the Senate, only fathers. Um, and they were seen in some sense as like the fathers of, of Rome, at least during the Republican period when the Senate actually had more power. Uh, and then there are two orders of society. There are the aristocrats, known as patricians, and then the common people known as plebeians. And the word patrician, patrici in Latin, uh, again has patres, pater, father, as its root word. Um, so, uh, again, there, there is this sense of authority associated with these, these high, the, the, the higher people, the higher status individuals in society. <clears throat> Plebeians, as I say, are the common citizens, or at least the non-noble ones. They, they can be as rich as, as aristocrats, but they're not aristocrats. Um, and a lot of the history of Rome, uh, especially from the, the end of the, the kingdom of Rome up to the fall of the Republic consists of plebeians trying to get more rights and freedoms uh, away from the patricians. Uh, we call this the struggle of the orders. Uh, and, and originally patricians and plebeians were forbidden to marry. Certain offices of the state were denied to plebeians. Um, and so the history, the development of the Roman government is based on the struggle for power. And of course it is about men it's always about men in, in politics in Rome um, and masculinity. So I put a, um, a, a kind of chart of, or a list of, of different key events. Essentially the, the plebeians, because they were the ones who did most of the work and the ones who fought in the army, when they, they, could, they weren't getting the rights and, and, and liberties they demanded, they would go on strike. We call these the successions of the plebs. There were three of them. Um, and they concluded with uh, measures passed that, that in, in, in the assemblies giving them more or less eventually equal representation. Um, and one thing that, that came from this, interestingly enough, in early Rome, uh, the laws weren't written down initially. They, they were held by the patricians um, in an oral form or in the minds of, of the patricians meaning that they could more or less decide what they wanted to to be the law and that they held the government at that time and they could decide on the laws but one of the things the first succession of the plebs did was compel the patricians to write down the laws so that everyone could know you know what to what they were subject it's clear that they hadn't even though they were meant to have been committed to memory they weren't quite as as as, as inflexible as the patricians had perhaps made them out to be so um, a decumvirate, a group of ten men, had to come together to, to set down the laws. And the first, uh, initially there are ten tables then, and then twelve. I put in some excerpts from these, um, and, and tables four and five really drive home the, the kind of uh, gender roles, if you like, that Roman society reinforced in law, whereas the Greeks didn't necessarily do this. Um, they, they, they relied more on custom. The Romans relied on written law. We owe a lot to the Romans for their legal traditions, everything. They're, 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 this, is, this is the one sort of science where they excelled beyond the Greeks um, with their legal system and virtually all legal systems today in the West uh, derive either directly or indirectly from Roman law. One exception is English common law, which comes more from both Anglo-Saxon and Viking traditions, but influenced by Roman law. Scots law is, is more related to Roman law. But anyway, Table 4. Um, I'll read you out two of the laws here from Table 4. Monstrous or deformed offspring may be put to death by the father. So if someone ha gives birth to something, someone who's defect defective in some way, or we would say um, d disabled even perhaps, the father can just put them to death. The second one, the father shall during his whole life uh, have absolute power over his children. He may imprison his son, uh, scourge him, or keep him working in the fields in fetters, or put him to death, uh, even if the son holds the highest office of the state. So enshrined in the Twelve Tables, and the Twelve Tables will be revised upon, they're, they're not 
they don't stay exactly the same throughout all of Roman history, but they are the foundations of their legal system. And as I say, if, if someone whose father is still alive gets elected to, say, the consulship, which is the highest office in the land, um, they would be expected to have to go through a ceremony uh, of being emancipated from their father. Otherwise, the father could actually tell them what to do, even though they're the highest office in the land. Table 5 um, very much indicates the role of women. Uh, plainly and clearly, it says that all women shall be under the authority of a guardian. Um, and, and that guardian is either her father or her husband. Now, again, this would change somewhat with, with Roman women gaining more liberties. And in fact, one of the things that comes about under the regime of Augustus is that a woman who has had more than two children, I believe it was, uh, would be liberated, would be emancipated from her guardian. She, she could be a free citizen in her own right, uh, although she still couldn't run for public office or join the military. Table 5, Law 2 says the provisions of the will of the father of the house, the father of the family, pater familias, concerning his property and tutelage, that is, support of his family, shall have the force of law. So, again, this reinforces a tradition that will have been in existence up to this time uh, that a father of a household is essentially like a monarch uh, with, with, with near absolute authority. I put in a few more of the examples from the, the 12 tables if you're interested. Now, so as I'm saying, Rome, like the Greeks, Rome is a very phallocentric society. It's, it's slightly less misogynistic than Athens was, but still obsessed with, with maleness and masculinity and, and you know, how that's defined through dominance and power and, and manliness as they understood it. Um, so this, this kind of brings us, this brings us on to another issue of, of sort of what's the opposite, if you like, um, when is a man not being manly? And I've given you a couple of examples here from, from Plutarch and Suetonius's biographies of Julius Caesar. And, uh, so Julius Caesar, I won't, I won't go through the whole history of the man, but he was a politician before he became dictator of Rome, um, and a general. And, and being a politician during the, the late Republic, he was keen on getting elected. Um, he had a military career, pardon me, and um, that this, was, this was necessary. And this, this again further illustrates the sort of definition of masculinity in that a Roman politician of the Republican era was expected to have had a military career. Um, you know, if he, if he conquered something, if he added territory to Rome in, in the course of that career, then all the better. He might stand a better chance of getting elected. And Caesar certainly did that. But we're told that in his youth, um, and I'll, I'll say first of all about Plutarch and Suetonius. Plutarch is a Greek who wrote, who wrote biographies of the Romans as well as, as Greek, famous Greek individuals in the second century AD. Suetonius uh, is also, he's, he's Roman, he's a Roman senator. Um, of, of the same era who also wrote biographies. So Plutarch and, and, and Suetonius are both using similar sources. There are di differing degrees of, of accuracy and quality in both of them, but they both more or less agree um, on, on this event. And, and this, this, this illustrates a point that I'm, I'm going to talk about. So when Caesar was, was in his youth, um, 19 years old, we're told, and on his military career, we're told he sailed to King Nicomedes of Bithynia, um, being then 19 years of age, and by him was, and by his commander Marcus Thermus was sent to Bithynia in order to raise a fleet to assist in the siege of Mytilene. With the king, he tarried for a short time, and then Plutarch tells us about his voyage back. Uh, Plutarch glosses over a fact here, so that we know that this was part of Caesar's career. But if we go to Suetonius's version, and Suetonius actually had access to, to more detailed sources on this than Plutarch will have had, but I suspect Plutarch omits this bit of information that I'm about to give you out of a sense of um, propriety. Anyway, uh, this is Suetonius describing this visit to the king of Bithynia. Bithynia is in uh, sort of modern day Turkey, in effect, or thereabouts. This is Suetonius's account of what I just read. His first campaign was served in Asia on the staff of the praetor M. Thermus, and being dispatched into Bithynia to bring hence a fleet, he loitered so long at the court of Nicomedes as to give occasion to reports of lewd proceedings between him and that prince. 
which received additional credit from his hasty return to Bithynia under the pretext of recovering a debt due to a freedman, his client. Um, so what Suetonius is alluding to is that it, it, it's looking as if, and, and others allege this as well, Caesar had an affair with um, with this king. And the king, King Nicomedes, was known to like men, to like to have sex with men. Um, and now, in the case of the Romans, slightly differently from, well, a bit different from the Greeks in some respects, a bit similar in others, it comes down to who's on top, if you like. Um, it's perfectly acceptable for a male Roman citizen to have penetrative sexual intercourse with another male. Um, it is not acceptable for a Roman citizen, particularly one who wants to run for public office, or it's less acceptable for them to have, to, to have to have received penetrative sex from another individual. And because, um, because Caesar was quite young, the king would have been older, uh, the implication is that he was the, he, was, he was the bottom, if you like, in that relationship. Now, again, had it been anyone else other than a politician, a, a prominent one, it might not have mattered so much. But because it was Caesar, this was troubling for his career. So I put in a poem by Catullus. Catullus did not like Julius Caesar one bit. Uh, he, he disapproved of him heartily. And in this poem, number 29, um, he talks at length, he goes on at length, calling him uh, a sodomite, reminding people of this, um, of this incident. And um, I've got Suetonius talking about this as well. Um, I'll quote you what he says. Um, the poem also criticizes one an individual named Mam Mimius, rather, um, and Mamira, who was one of Caesar's agents. Um, and here's what uh, Suetonius says. After publishing some scandalous epigrams upon him, endeavored to effect a reconciliation by the intercession of friends, he wrote to him in his own words the first letter. And when Valerius Catullus, who had... Who had as he himself observed, fixed such a stain upon his character and his verses upon Mamura as never could be obliterated. He begged his pardon, Catullus did apparently, and invited him to supper the same day and continued to take up his lodging with his father occasionally, as he'd been accustomed to do. Anyway, uh, Suetonius is implying that, that essentially Catullus and Caesar made up. Catullus's father was a friend of Caesar's. Um, his house was in the province that Caesar ruled as governor something political happened. Now, Catullus the poet died fairly young, and we can't help but wonder if this had something to do with it. Um, but you see, having, you know, reminding people of, of Caesar perhaps having this affair with the, this king in his youth damaged his political career. I think Caesar had said, uh, you know, the, these few lines from this poet did more damage to me than all the armies in Gaul that I was fighting against during the, the Gaulish War. Um, it, 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 it hurt his political campaign. Now, whether entirely for political reasons or, or personal reasons, it's not clear. Uh, Caesar then seems to have cultivated uh, a kind of, 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 of reputation for being a womanizer. Um, and th again, this is from Suetonius's biography. I'll read you what he says. It is admitted by all that he was much addicted to women as well as very expensive in his intrigues with them, and that he debauched many ladies of the highest quality. He names some of them. For it is certain, um, uh, carry on a little bit, but his mistress, the mistress he most loved was Servilia, the mother of Marcus Brutus, for, for whom he purchased in his first consulship after the commencement of their intrigue a pearl, which cost him six millions of sesterces. And in the Civil War, besides other presents assigned to her for a trifling consideration, some valuable farms when they were exposed to public auction. Many persons expressing their surprise at, at the, the lowness of the price, Cicero wittily remarked, to let you know the real value of the purchases between ourselves, Tertia was deducted. And that's Servilia. Uh, for Servilia was supposed to have prostituted, oh, sorry, her daughter, prostituted her daughters, Ter Tertia, to Caesar. That he had intrigues likewise with married women in the provinces appears from a, a poem, and I put the poem in there as well. So, did Caesar have these actual intrigues with women? Um, 
maybe, maybe not. Hard to say. It's certainly, or, or is it just, you know, the case that he's trying to counterbalance these accusations that he you know, takes it up the rear from men, or did at some point? I think there's some prob there's probably truth to both of those things, um, and we're pretty sure he was in a relationship with Servilia. In fact, Servilia's son Brutus was one of the people who assassinated him um, on the Ides of March 44 BC. And his last words, not according to Shakespeare, et tu Brute, you also Brutus, uh, they were in Greek, and what he said was, you also my son. So there was some, and, and some of the sources at the time imply that, that Brutus might have actually been Caesar's illegitimate son. Um, so he probably did have this affair with Servilia. Did he have all these other affairs, or was it just a kind of reputational, um, you know, damage control? Hard to say. But it's interesting that, um, you know, in order to promote his masculinity, to, to actualize his masculinity, to promote, promote his manliness and his worthiness as a politician, um, he's spreading rumors, encouraging rumors, it seems, that he's a womanizer. Um, and again, like I say, who penetrates whom in a same-sex relationship seems to have been important. There are some examples of this attitude as well in the propaganda wars that took place between Octavian and Mark Antony. And I've got some examples from those too. Uh, so um, this is again, this is from Suetonius's biography of Octavian, who would become Augustus Caesar. And uh, according to him, in his early youth, he incurred the reproach of sundry shameless acts. Sextus Pompey, that's the son of Pompey Magnus, taunted him with effeminacy. Mark Antony, with having earned adoption by his uncle, that's Julius Caesar, through unnatural relations, implying that he had sex with Caesar um, in order to be adopted by him. And Lucius, brother of Mark Antony, that after sacrificing his honor to Caesar, he, he had himself given to Alice Hirtius in Spain, this is a consul and a general, for 300,000 sesterces, and that he used to singe his legs with red-hot nutshells to make the hair grow softer. What is more, one day when there were plays in the theater, all the people took as directed against him and loudly applauded the following lines spoken on the stage in referring to uh, the priest of the mother of the gods as he beat his timbrel. See, seest how a wanton, wanton's finger sways the world. So there were accusations against Octavian that he had prostituted himself, that he'd had sex with men, again implying that he was the, the penetrated partner, including Julius Caesar. Um, and is it true? I don't know. I think the stuff from Antony is probably either an exaggeration or just made up to try and damage his character, but, but this is the sort of thing that the politicians were, were doing at the time to damage their enemies' characters. Um, and then Octavian, a bit like Julius Caesar, you know, goes the other way and, and tries, to, uh, tries to promote a sense of, um, of, of, his, of, his, of his, you know, womanizing. So here's another quote. Uh, from from what's from from Suetonius that he was given this is talking about Octavian Augustus Caesar that he was given to adultery not even his friends deny although it is true that they excuse it as committed not from passion but from policy uh, the more readily to get track of his adversaries' designs through the women of their of their household so <laughs> Suetonius is saying that um, the excuse was for all the sleeping around that, that Octavian was uh, having these affairs with married women to learn what their husbands were up to maybe. Mark Antony charged him besides his hasty marriage with Livia with taking the wife of an ex-consul from her husband's dining room before his very eyes into a bedchamber and bringing her back to the table with her hair in, in disorder and her ears glowing. Uh, that Scribonia was divorced because she expressed her resentment. Scribonia was Octavian's ex-wife. Res resentment too freely at the excessive influence of a rival and that his friends acted as his panders and stripped and inspected matrons and well-grown well girls as if uh, Tyrannus, the slave dealer, were putting them up for sale. Um, Antony also writes to Augustus himself in the following familiar terms, when he had not yet wholly broken with him privately or publicly. This is from a letter from Mark Antony. It says, What has made such a change in you? Because I lie with the queen, she is my wife. Am I, am I just beginning this, or was this nine years ago? What then of you? Do you, do you lie only with Drusilla? 
good luck to you if, if when you read this letter you have not been with Tertullia or Tarantella or Ophelia or Salvia Titicina or all of them. Does it matter where or with whom you take your pleasure? So Antony is getting some flack because of his affair with Cleopatra and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and he's written this letter to Octavian saying, you know, what about that? What, what if I'm having an affair with her? What about all the affairs you're having? Um, and again, is this is this what he's really doing? It might well be, uh, or is it is it also part of, of, of promoting his his virility, his masculinity? Um, from Suetonius again, uh, this is about Octavian being offered the title Father of the Fatherland, a title of which he was immensely proud. We're told. So this is Suetonius saying, the whole body of citizens with a sudden unanimous impulse proffered him the title of father of the fatherland, pater patriae, first the commons by a deputation sent to Antium, and then because he declined it, again at Rome as he entered the theatre, which they attended in throngs, all wearing laurel wreaths. The senate afterwards in the house, not by a decree, but by acclamation, uh, but through Valerius Messala. Messala. He, speaking for the whole body, said, Good fortune and divine favor attend thee in thy house, Caesar Augustus. For thus we feel that we are praying for lasting prosperity for our country and happiness for our city. The Senate, in accord with the people of Rome, hails thee, Father of the Fatherland. Then Augustus, with tears in his eyes, replied as follows, and I have given his exact words as I did those of Masala. Augustus said, Having attained my highest hopes, fathers of the Senate, what more have I to ask of the immortal gods than that I may retain this same unanimous approval of, of yours to the very end of my life? Um, so he's very proud, and notice that he, reluctant, he reluctantly accepts it. He refuses the title initially, uh, and then he only accepts it after they've offered it a couple of times. Other emperors would do the same thing. It's not just a symbolic title. As I say, it's placing him literally in charge of the country in, in the way that um, that a father is to the household. Now, now it, it's only really confirming what was the political reality. Augustus won the Civil War. He was the last man standing. He had the army as, as loyal to him. Nobody could oppose him. Um, and, and they're just really reaffirming this with this title. But the, he took this very personally. Um, and, uh, and 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 he he seems to have been you know very very keen on this title. Um, back to this notion of, of his of his virility, if you like, and his womanizing, which which again it seems almost over the top. But uh, his his wife, his first wife, divorces. He divorces because apparently she was complaining too much about about uh, his his uh, sleeping around. His second wife, Livia, and we'll talk about her as well in a moment, was, was, was more tolerant. Um, but, but she, now, now Livia is quite an extraordinary individual. She is one of the most powerful women in Rome. Uh, and yet she, she comes across as this sort of matronly figure. So how were women in Rome supposed to behave? Um, they were, they were supposed to be mothers, they were supposed to be wives. Uh, when we look at the Livy passage, you know, one of them, uh, Lucretia, she's the wife of a noble. She wins a contest for being the best wife because when, when the nobles come back to see what the what wives are up to, she's sewing and doing the housework or overseeing the slaves doing the housework and the other women are, are, are playing or you know, at, at some sort of sport. So a good, a good wife oversees the household. Um, in the case of Livia Augusta, the wife of Augustus Caesar, and again this is Octavian, he becomes Augustus Caesar, first emperor of Rome, uh, she presents a kind of twofold image of femininity and power. She was the most powerful woman in Rome. She had her own security forces, her own spy network, her own assassins, uh, and later she would be deified as, as the divine Livia Augusta. Um, and yet she rarely appeared in public except to support her husband. And uh, it was made known she actually sewed his clothes for him. Um, pardon me. So she's doing the sort of things that's, that are appropriate for a Roman woman. She's, she's not certainly, you know, uh, 
advertising her power, though her power was real. She exerted an influence over Augustus. Um, you know, she, she, we're told that she intervened on at least one occasion for a city that was in, in need, and, and changed his, got him to change his policies. Um, and when and when Augustus required it, she even brought him, so we're told, young women for his pleasure, and did this without complaint. Um, this again, according to Suetonius, his amorous propensities never left him, and as he grew older. As is reported, he was in the habit of debauching young girls who were procured for him from all quarters, even by his own wife. So she plays her part incredibly shrewdly, incredibly well, um, coming across as a matronly woman, a good mother, uh, and yet she's the most powerful woman in the whole of the empire. She was universally loved by the Roman public, seen as a paragon of, Romanly, of womanly rather virtue. Although some later writers, like Tacitus, writing about the same time as Suetonius, would be convinced that she was responsible for Augustus's death, having poisoned him, um, she might well have been responsible for, for the deaths of multiple heirs to the throne. Augustus had a number of, of grandchildren and, 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 and younger ch and, and children who were adopted into his family or married into his family that he wanted to be his heirs. They all died. Um, some under mysterious circumstances, such that Tiberius, who was not his biological son, but was his adopted stepson by Livia, is the one who inherits the throne. Um, it's possible that Livia had something to do with removing all the people in, in the place of standing in the way of her son, uh, but the evidence is lacking, so we can't condemn her for it. She was a controversial figure, but was largely seen in a positive light, especially during her own lifetime. By contrast, the Greek queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, was viewed as monstrous. So, unlike Livia, she's a powerful woman who advertises her power and her sexuality as well. Um, she was a woman who's in charge. Romans don't like, they don't like monarchs, first of all, um, and they don't like women as monarchs. So, she's a woman who's in charge of a kingdom and was seen and certainly spun in the propaganda afterwards as, as having corrupted a good Roman, Mark Antony, with her evil influences. So, um, Antony at the time was married to Octavian's sister, Octavia. This, this was a, a political marriage. I don't know how much you know about the history of Rome at this time. Uh, there's a political arrangement called the, the Second Triumvirate, under uh, Octavian and Mark Antony and a man named Lepidus. These three control the empire and as part of the political arrangement Antony marries Octavian's sister. Now something similar had happened during the first triumvirate which was between Julius Caesar, Pompey Magnus and uh, a man named Crassus. Um, Julius Caesar marries his daughter off to Pompey Magnus and that's why in that poem of Catullus he refers to stepfather and stepson, or oh, sorry, to, to yeah, father-in-law. So Caesar was Pompey's father-in-law. But this is another political marriage in the case of Octavia. Octavian is married to her by Roman tradition, acknowledged and accepted in Rome. She's living in his house, looking after his children. Um, and, uh, but then Antony goes off and, and has this affair with, um, with 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 Cleopatra, and I put in the notes here about the political marriage. Um, Octavia is his legitimate wife. Cleopatra, he actually marries Cleopatra, according to Egyptian tradition, but Egyptian tradition isn't recognized by Rome. He has children with her. Let me give you this from Plutarch's biography of Mark Antony. As for Octavia. She was thought to have been treated with scorn, and when she came back from Athens, Caesar ordered her, that's Octavian Caesar at this time, ordered her to dwell in her own house, but she refused to leave the house of her husband. Nay, she even entreated Caesar himself, unless on other grounds he had determined to make war upon Antony, to ignore Antony's treatment of her, since it was an infamous thing even to, to have it said, the two greatest leaders in the world plunge the Romans into civil war, the one out of passion for and the, the, the other out of resentment on behalf of a woman. These were her words, and she confirmed them by her deeds, for she dwelt in her husband's house. 
just as, it, as if he were at home, and she cared for his children, not only those whom she herself had, but also those from whom Fulvia, his, his previous wife, had borne him, in a noble and magnificent manner. She also received such friends of Antony as were sent to Rome in quest of office or on business, and helped them to obtain from Caesar what they wanted. Without meaning it, however, she was damaging Antony by this conduct of hers, for he was hated for wrong, wronging such a woman. He was hated, too, for the distribution which he made to his children in Alexandria. It's called the Donations of Alexandria. He leaves large portions of the Roman Empire to his children with, with Cleopatra, um, at least titular positions. They weren't necessarily going to, he wasn't literally giving the land to them, but they were going to be in charge of some of the provinces under Roman control. This went down very badly in Rome, though it looked as if he was carving up the Roman Empire. And um, at the same time, he, he's he's you know he's he's adopting foreign customs. He's hanging out with and debauching himself with, with Cleopatra. And when it, when it finally comes to war, to civil war between Antony and Octavian, it's Cleopatra who gets blamed. So again, from Plutarch's biography of Antony. When Caesar had made sufficient preparations, a vote was passed to wage war against Cleopatra, and to take away from Antony the authority which he had surrendered to a woman. And Caesar said in addition that, this is Octavian Caesar, said in addition that Antony had been drugged and was not even master of himself, and that the Romans were carrying on war with, with Mardion the eunuch, and Pothinus and Eros, and, and the tire woman of, of Cleopatra, and Carmion, by whom the principal affairs of government were managed, but, but not Antony. So Antony is a victim here. Um, Octavian knew what was going on. He, he, he had hoped to de depose Antony, and this gave him a, a pretext. But they declare war on Cleopatra. Um, she's the villain. And there would be poetry written afterwards about how, how horrible she was and, and monstrous, and she corrupted this good man, Antony. But uh, it is interesting, and, and it reveals volumes about the Romans' attitudes towards uh, gender and, and how it plays into the political arena so so intimately, you know, from, from an, even an early period on. So I'll, I'll briefly go over the readings I've asked you to look at from Livy. Um, you have the rape of the Sabine women. This is a story of how early Rome needed women, so they stole some from their neighbors. Um, it may be it may be based on a, on a true story, and so read that and see what you think. That's from Livy, his early history of Rome, and then after that you have the rape and suicide of Lucretia, um, and this is this is this this model aristocratic woman who gets raped by the son of the king, the last king of Rome. The king's name is Tarquin, the proud. His son is Sextus. Sextus rapes Lucretia. And, uh, and I'll, I'll let you read the story, but this results in a, a, a war in which the king, the last king of Rome, is deposed. Um, interesting how the, these women come into such crucial moments of Roman history. There's another one, the death of Virgina. Um, this occurs around the time of the, the writing of the Twelve Tables, remember the decumvirate that I've told you about. They, well, one of their leaders doesn't want to give up his power. After he's reformed the constitution, he wants to hold on to his power. He tries to take a free woman, um, claiming she's his slave, and her father kills her. <gasps> um, and 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 this, this the outrage that, that the father had rather kill the child than, you know, submit her to this this man, provokes another succession of the plebs and the overthrow of a tyrant. Again good women seem to die at key moments of Roman history. And the last one that I've asked you to look at is the uh, uh, Horatio Cockles, a hero of early Rome and the kind of exemplar of manliness, if you like, that uh, that he puts forth. So these are the readings. I've given you all this. They're in, in with the notes. And um, so we'll, we'll talk, we can talk further about some of the, the biographies of, 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 of people like Caesar and Octavian and Mark Antony and things like that and Cleopatra, um, but but hopefully you get the sense. And there there are sort of questions interspersed throughout the lecture, which you, you can you know in the notes that you can look at, and we'll we'll talk about in class. I've I've gone through most of them here already, so we'll think about you know the title Father of the Fatherland, what that means, and how Roman women are portrayed. Um, you know what makes a good woman or a bad woman, um, and and how these things relate prominently to politics.
So thank you very much for your attention, and I shall look forward to uh, seeing you all in class next week. Bye for now.